Lord, with one heart and one mind, worshiping your goodness, your faithfulness. And Lord, how thankful we are for these few short minutes you give us, that we can set aside the cares and concerns of the day, for there are many, and turn our hearts and our minds and voices toward you in worship and praise and adoration. And Lord, we not only worship you through the songs we sing, but now, Lord, we worship you through the study of your word. So, Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts that we may understand all that you have for us, that we would be changed, transformed, to become more like you. Let it be so, we pray, in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask, and all God's saints say, amen, amen. amen. Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 8, verse 48. John chapter 8, verse 48. Last time we were together, Jesus was still in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, that seventh and final feast in Judaism. According to verse 20 of John chapter 8, he was in the treasury of the temple teaching the people. And we had mentioned last time that he taught them about three things. First of all, he taught them about discipleship. And Jesus said that if you want to be a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus Christ, it involved believing in him and abiding in him. The second thing he dealt with was freedom. Freedom, something the Jews clearly misunderstood. Uh, they thought they had freedom from day one. But the truth is, physically speaking, they had been enslaved many times. In fact, even now, they were under the bondage of Rome. Jesus wasn't speaking of physical freedom. He was speaking of spiritual freedom. Freedom from sin, death, and hell. Now, the third and final issue Jesus dealt with involved descendants, because the Jews were, in fact, descendants of Abraham. But the problem is they were not children of Abraham. And Jesus made a distinction between descendants and children. Yes, while they descended from Abraham, they were not acting like the children of Abraham. Why? Well, because they desired, desired to kill Jesus. Therefore, they were not children of Abraham. According to verse 44, they were children of the devil because he is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. It was then... According to verse 48 of John chapter 8, the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Well, then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. <laughs> are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Now Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Well, then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Well, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was... I am. Well, then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, Jesus, during this Feast of Tabernacles, had made some pretty incredible claims. Uh, back in chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus said, I am the one who can quench your thirst. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
In verse 36, he said, I am the one that will make you free. But by far, the most incredible claim that Jesus will make will be found in verse 58 of John chapter 8 when he says, before Abraham was, I am. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. But as a result of these incredible claims that Jesus had made during this Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews now begin to attack Jesus. And in verses 48 through 59, there are four of them. Four ways they attack Jesus. Now, all four of these attacks are going to be looked at in light of two things. First of all, uh, the attack against Jesus, and second, the response by Jesus. So let's drop back and take a look at this first attack. And we see that they attack him personally. The first attack, they attack him personally. That's in verses 48 through 51. And as we mentioned, there are two things involved. Number one, uh, it involves quite obviously the attack against Jesus. Look at verse 48. In verse 48 of John 8, it says, Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Now here they begin to attack him personally. You see, back in verse 46, Jesus asked them a question. Which of you convicts me of sin? In other words, what have I done wrong? Now, none of them could convict him of any sin because he had done nothing wrong. And since they couldn't attack him on any legitimate issue, they now attack him personally. And the attack is twofold, according to verse 28. First attack is they say he is a Samaritan. Now, this was a real slap in the face for any Jewish person because the Samaritans were hated by the Jews for a couple of reasons. Uh, at the end of the divided kingdom in 722 BC, when the Assyrian Empire came down and attacked the 10 northern tribes called Israel, they took them into Assyrian captivity. Now, the Jews had subsequently intermarried with the Assyrians. So they weren't pure Jews, we would say. And therefore, they were hated by the Jews who were not intermarrying with the Assyrians. Now, according to the first wave of exiles that had left the Babylonian captivity under Cyrus, the king of Persia. You women will be studying this in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapters 9 and 10, Sally will have it outlined for you amazingly. I've uh, seen some of the study already. In 538 BC, when Cyrus, the king of Persia, released the first waves from Babylon back to Jerusalem, he sent a fella by the name of Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel was going to go back and rebuild the temple after the Babylonian captivity. The Samaritans desired to help, but Zerubbabel would not allow them to build the temple with them because they were steep in idolatry. And as a result of that, they built their own temple there on Mount Gerizim. And because of that, the Jews hated them all the more. So for them to say that Jesus was a Samaritan was a real attack against him personally. But the second personal attack in verse 48 is they said he had a demon, a demon. Now that's not the first time they said that, by the way. Uh, back in John chapter 7, verse 20, they said he had a demon. Uh, it won't be the last time either. In John chapter 10, verse 20, they're going to say he had a demon. And here's the point. When the legitimate arguments against Jesus failed because there were no legitimate arguments to come against him, they then launched in this ad hominem attack. They began to call him names. They began to attack him personally. 
<laughs> you know, as I was going over that this week, I had to chuckle as we are still battling the county and the wineries and uh, standing up for our religious freedoms, which are disappearing one by one, by the way. Uh, things are going very well, I might add, but it's been interesting these last few weeks as there's been no real legitimate arguments against us being able to build a church and have a Christian school. They launched this campaign against me personally. This ad hominem attack, calling me all kinds of names and saying all, you can't believe the things they're saying about me. <laughs> well, maybe you can. <laughs> but it doesn't bother me. It doesn't get under my skin. I really don't care. Because I'm so used to it. <laughs> Because God knows, God knows the truth. And you know, I think this is a great encouragement for all of us, because whether we're, we're at home, we're at work, we're at school, we're at play, look, people are gonna say some pretty crazy things about us, and we need to be okay with it. I mean, unless it's true, of course, then we need to repent and get right with God. Uh, but you know, no matter what people say, we're gonna stand before God, not man, and we need to be clear before the Lord. And these kind of attacks didn't phase Jesus at all. Which brings us to the second thing in this first series of attacks. We've looked at the attack against Jesus. Now let's take a look at the response by Jesus. The response by Jesus to this first attack in verses 49 through 51. He responds in light of three things. Number one, he first deals with honor honor. But look at verse 49. In verse 49, Jesus answered, and here's what he said. He said, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. So the first thing he brings up in his response to this ad hominem, ad hominem attack, saying he's a Samaritan and has a demon, is honor. Now, the word honor is the word tomeo. It's used 21 times in the New Testament. It means to revere, to esteem, to hold in high value. And the point is very simple. Jesus cannot have a demon because he honors his father. If he didn't honor the father, then you can say he might have a demon. But since he honors the Father, there's no way he could be demon-possessed. And I think the point for you and the point for me becomes very important. Because this whole idea about demons and Satan, I mean, let's face it, it can be a pretty scary thought. But for you and I as believers, we do not have to worry about being demon-possessed. There are many who have come to me worried about this very thing. They say, Pastor, I think I might have a demon. And I ask them, well, are you saved? Is Jesus your Lord? They say, yes, he is. I say, well, then you can't have a demon. It's physically impossible. Because the moment we give our life to Jesus Christ, the moment we bow the knee, confess our sin, and ask him to become our Lord and Savior, he then gives us his Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11, Acts 5, 32, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Timothy 1, 14. The Spirit of the living God is now living inside of you and inside of me as believers. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, that you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So the Holy Spirit that's living inside of us is greater than he who is living outside of us. And I say praise God, hallelujah to that. Now while it's true, Satan cannot possess us as believers, he can oppress us as believers. He would love nothing more than to keep throwing those fiery darts our way. 
He would not love nothing more than to, for us to hear that sound as of a roaring lion, lion, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Yes, he's on the war path. Yes, he's on the attack. Many of us have experienced that in our own lives. We feel the enemy coming against us and those fiery darts being fired at us. And if you have not yet experienced these spiritual warfare attacks in your life, uh, cheer up, you will. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Now, if you want to diminish those attacks, just sit back and do nothing. No. Just sit back, relax. Don't get involved in serving the Lord. Don't get excited about studying his word. But you know, when we really step up and step out by faith in our service to the Lord and praying for others to the Lord in the study of the word of the Lord, man, the enemy's not gonna be happy with that. He's gonna come at us with both barrels, we might say. But praise be to God, you and I are victorious the Bible says in Romans 8, 37, that we are more than conquerors. And I say, bring it on. <laughs> Number two, the second part of his response involves God. It involves God. Look at verse 50. In verse 50, Jesus said, and I do not seek my own glory, but the thought is there is one who seeks glory and who is. Judges. Now, of course, he's pointing them to God because there is only one who can seek glory and there is only one that can judge. And it's pointing to and speaking of God. Uh, Revelation 4.11 says, You, O Lord, are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. And the point here is very simple. Even with all of Jesus' claims, even with all that Jesus has have done, he never brought glory to himself. He was always giving glory to the Father. And I think this is a good word for us because there's a beautiful parallel being painted here because Jesus was used mightily by God here on the earth. And he subsequently gave all glory to God. And that sets the example for us. You know, when God begins to use you, when God begins to raise you up and do a great work in and through your lives, it's very important we give all the glory to God because it is very easy for us to try to receive some of that glory for ourselves. I mean, that's just how we're built. We have that mindset, well, yeah, God's a pretty smart fella. You know, he chose me after all. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? God uses rocks and donkeys. He doesn't need any of us. And if somehow something good happens and you happen to be involved with it, <laughs> all glory needs to go to God. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, whether you eat or drink, no matter what you do, do all to the glory of God. Back to John chapter 8. Uh, let's come to the third and final aspect of his response to this first attack against him personally. And that involves repentance. Repentance. It's subtle, but I think we see it in verse 51. Take a look. In verse 51, Jesus concludes his response by saying, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. I think Jesus here was giving them an opportunity to repent. Now, of course, he's talking about spiritual death, something they didn't get, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But when we're doing his word, it means we've come to a place in our lives where we've repented of what we were doing, and now we're doing what the Lord says to do. We're doing his word. And that speaks of repentance. And repentance is a huge issue in the scripture, by the way. I realize it's not a popular topic in many churches today. In fact, I've talked to pastors recently who said they never talk about the death, blood, and crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the issue of sin and the issue of repentance because it's offensive to people. 
One fella told me that. I said, well, you just offended me. The gospel is an offense. The Bible's very clear. And God help us when we lose sight of the importance of repentance. The word simply means to turn. To turn from what we were doing to what we should be doing. Which of course lines up with the word of God. That's why Jesus said in verse 51, If anyone keeps my word... Keeping the word involves believing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, accepting him as such, repenting of our sins, and then we will never see death. Now that certainly doesn't mean we're not going to die physically, but it does mean we'll never die spiritually. We'll never see eternal death, spiritually speaking. Why? Well, because we're born again. We've repented We've come to faith in Christ. And now we've been guaranteed eternal life with him. Uh, back to John chapter 8. Let's come to the second attack. In this second attack, they attack his importance. They attack his importance. That's in verses 52 through 56. And of course, we would mention two things. Number one, let's take a look at the attack against Jesus. It's very simple in verses 52 and 53. Take a look. In verse 52, it says, Then the Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, they've all died. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than? than our father Abraham. Here they're attacking his importance because to them, Father Abraham was one of the most important people in Jewish history. So are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets who are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? In other words, who do you think you are? Are you more important than our father Abraham? Because he's dead. All the prophets are dead. And you said if anybody obeys your word, he'll never taste death. Now, clearly, clearly, they misunderstood Jesus. Jesus was talking spiritually. You would never see spiritual death. They, of course, were thinking physically, bringing up the issue of Abraham because he died physically. So number one, they misunderstood Jesus. But number two, they misquoted Jesus. Did you catch that? They misquoted Jesus. In verse 51, Jesus said, he shall never see death. But in verse 52, they said, he shall never taste death. So clearly, they misquoted Jesus because the attacks weren't working. And that is a very common idea. When attacks against somebody aren't really working, they misquote you. And that's one reason I never like to talk to the newspaper or the TV. Uh, we're getting calls all the time. Clark, would you like to do an interview? Can we do an interview? Would you like to come in? down and talk or send the cameras. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Because you never know what they're going to say. They'll always take you out of context and misquote you. And here we see that against Jesus. You say, well, Clark, that's all fine and dandy, but what's the point? The point in this attack involves his importance. Who do you think you are? Are you more important than Abraham? That's really the question. Which brings us to the response by Jesus. Now the response in verses 54 through 56 involves three things. The first thing involves honor by his father. Honor by his father. Look at verse 54. When they said, who do you think you are? Are you more important than Abraham? Jesus said, look, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Now here Jesus talks about the fact that God, the father, 
has honored him. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Are you more important than Abraham? No, hey, I'm not honoring myself. If any honor comes to me, it comes from the Father whom you call your God. Now that's the point. The question is this. When did God honor the Son? Well, at least at the baptism in Matthew chapter 3 verse 17, God honored the Son when he said, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Clearly he was honored at the baptism by God. In fact, in John chapter 17, in verses 4 and 5, it says that Jesus Christ was honored while he was on the earth by God and before creation. So God was constantly honoring the Son from the beginning of time. And the point is very simple. <laughs> the question is, who do you think you are? Well, I am one that is honored by God. That's who I think I am, Jesus is proclaiming. Which brings us to the second part of his response, and that involves the knowledge of his Father. The knowledge of his Father. Look at verse 55. In verse 55, Jesus said, Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. This speaks of the knowledge of his Father. Jesus knows the Father. It's the word gnosko. It speaks of that intimate knowledge, a personal first-hand ex experiential type of knowledge. Who do you think you are is the question, is the attack. Are you greater than Abraham? Who do you think you are? Well, I'm not a liar like you. <laughs> That's what he said in verse 55. I'm one who knows the Father. I've always known the Father. In fact, I keep the word of the Father. In fact, back in verse 29, everything I do pleases the Father. So who do you think you are, Jesus? Well, I'm one that really knows God. Very simple. Number three and finally. The third and final aspect of his response involves rejoicing by their father. Rejoicing by their father. Look at verse 56. Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Who do you think you are? Are you more important than Abraham? Hey, <laughs> Abraham, your father, rejoiced to see my day. In fact, he was glad when he saw it and rejoiced. Question. When did... Abraham see Jesus. Well, no doubt back in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 18, right before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember the three men that came to Abraham's tent? One of the, two of them were angels. The Bible's very clear in chapter 19 of Genesis. One of them was the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ himself, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And Abraham was glad to see the day of the Lord. He bowed down and worshiped him, fed him. It was, it was an amazing encounter. You say, well, Clark, is that the only time that Abraham saw Jesus and rejoiced? No, it's not. You remember in Luke chapter 16, we have the story of the rich man and Lazarus. They both died. The rich man went to Hades. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom or paradise. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, his body went to the grave. His spirit went to paradise. Remember he told the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise, which is in the center of the earth, by the way. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and on, when the Jews were seeking a sign. Jesus said, an evil 
An adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah, who for three days and three nights was in the belly of the great fish, so too the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In fact, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, he ascended. But what does this mean? But that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So Abraham's bosom, Hades, was made up of two compartments. One, the bad side, we call it hell, and the good side, Abraham's bosom. All of the Old Testament saints who died before the cross, they died by faith, looking forward to God's promise of the coming Messiah, went to Abraham's bosom or paradise. All the rest went to the bad side of Hades or hell. Now, Jesus went to paradise, Abraham's bosom, and there for three days he preached to the captives. And according to Psalm 68, 18, he led captivity captive. He took all of the Old Testament saints out of Abraham's bosom, paradise, and he took them up into heaven. That's where they're at today. Just like you and I, when we die today, our body goes to the ground, and it doesn't matter if you're buried, burned, or embalmed. Our spirit goes to heaven, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Now, Jesus was in Abraham's bosom for three days. So clearly, Abraham saw his day and no doubt rejoiced in it. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, in verses 8 through 13, we have the story of Abraham and how he died by faith, looking forward to the promise of God's Messiah. So yes, he saw his day and he rejoiced when he did. You say, well, Clark, that's all fine and dandy, but what's the point of this third and final response? Well, the point is simple. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Well, I'm the one Abraham rejoiced to see when he saw me. You see, it's very simple, but it's incredibly profound. Uh, back to John chapter 8. Is everyone okay? Let's come to a third attack. We said there were four. The third attack is they attack his claim. They attack his claim. That's in verses 57 and 58. And of course, there are two sections here. Uh, number one, let's take a look at the attack against Jesus. That's in verse 57. In verse 57 of John 8, it says, Then the Jews said to him, you are, not fifth, you are not yet 50 years old. He's a very young man. <laughs> and have you seen Abraham? Now, they really thought they were pretty smart at this point because, of course, Abraham had died. Abraham died some two thousand years before Christ. From creation to Abraham, you have about 2,000 years. From Abraham to Christ, you have about 2,000 years. And from Christ to us, you have about 2,000 years, which means we're entering into that 7,000th year. And the number seven is the number of creation. And we'll talk a little more about this next Sunday when we do our prophecy update. But here we see they think they really had Jesus. Hey, you're not even 50 years old. Abraham lived 2,000 years ago. How in the world could he possibly see you and rejoice? Now, that's the attack. They're attacking his claim. Now, let's take a look at the response. The response by Jesus. In verse 58, Jesus said to them a very familiar verse. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now this little phrase, I am, ego a me, is a very powerful proclamation that Jesus makes. How so? Well, 
back in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses was there in the wilderness of Midian, tending the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro, he saw that bush that was on fire, the burning bush. So he walks over to investigate it, and God says, Moses, where you're standing, it's holy ground. Take off your sandals. And Moses begins to talk to God there in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And God was recruiting Moses to go to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel out of their 430 years of Egyptian slavery, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, and to bring them into the promised land. Well, Moses didn't think this was such a great idea at first because he said, well, you know, Lord, I'd love to help you out, but yeah, I don't think I'm your guy. I'm really not good at speaking. I kind of stutter as I go. I'm really not that sharp. And, and, uh, and, and I could just see God saying, well, you know, Mo, that's why I chose you. <laughs> But God said, don't worry about it. Moses will have your brother Aaron come and help you. He'll be the mouthpiece, but I want to use you to bring the children of Israel out. And finally, Moses acquiesced. He gave in. He said, okay, Lord, I'll go. And then, interestingly enough, he asked God, oh, by the way, he goes, you know, when I get down to Israel or down to the children of Israel in Egypt, they're going to have a few questions for me. And I venture to say one question they're going to have is, what is your name? What's your name, God? And then God, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, tells him this. He says, you tell him, I am sent you. For my name is I am. You see, when Jesus said before Abraham was, I am the thought here is very simple. Who do you think you are, Jesus? I am God. That's the point he's making. And this becomes very significant because God's name is not a noun, it's a verb. Okay, a verb <laughs> is an action word. God's not simply a person, place, or thing. The word I am literally means the becoming one. I am becoming whatever you need me to be. And here, Jesus, answering their attack against his claim, who do you think you are? I am God. Unfortunately, there are many groups today who do not believe that Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh. You know, yesterday, Mary Lou and the gang had put on the Christmas play here at the church. It was so stinking cute. These kids were amazing. And I really loved the play. I mean, every year it just gets better and better. I mean, this was the gospel message, the story of God Almighty stepping out of eternity into time and space through the birth of Jesus Christ. How God took on the additional nature of man, being 100% God and 100% man, came in the form of man to die for the sins of all mankind. And I'll tell you, it was just an amazing thing to realize that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we've got the banners up right behind us. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. In John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas said, called Jesus my Lord and my God. In Romans 9, 5, Jesus is called the eternally blessed God. In 1 John 5, 20, he is the true God. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, God the Father even calls the Son 
God when he said, your throne, O God, will last forever. Friends, make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ, right here in John chapter 8, verse 58, makes the strongest, most clearest declaration of his deity that one could possibly hope for. And I say, praise God, hallelujah for that. Back to John chapter 8. Let's come to the fourth and final response, and we'll wrap it up right here. The fourth and final uh, attack, rather. The fourth and final attack is we see they attack him physically. They attack him physically. That's in verse 59. And again, we would mention two things. Uh, first of all, the attack against Jesus is seen. At the beginning of verse 59, it says, Then they took up stones to throw at him. When all the other attacks failed, the last resort is always physical violence. When none of the other charges could stick, none of the other attacks could be justified, they were so mad, so upset, they began to attack him physically. They no doubt understood that he was claiming to be God, going back to the burning bush passage of Exodus 3.14. And they were going to kill him for that. The very thing Jesus said they were trying to do all along. Back in verse 37, they were trying to kill him. In verse 40, Jesus said they were trying to kill him. They denied it both times. No, we're not trying to kill you. And here we see what was truly in their heart now begins to manifest itself in their hands. But you know what really struck me is that Jesus knew their heart. Jesus knows what's going on in our heart and that should scare the far out of all of us. Look, we're not pulling the wool over God's eyes. Oh, we might fool our friends and neighbors. We might skirt the law, but we're not fooling God. Hebrews 4.13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight all things are naked and open to whom to him we must give an account. In Proverbs 15.3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees the good and the evil. And here God shows us that what was in their heart is now manifesting itself through their hands, which brings us to the response by Jesus. At the end of verse 59, it says, Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them, so passed by. Now when it says Jesus hid himself, I just don't picture Jesus going around uh, one of those multiple trumpet collectors in the treasury hiding behind it. Uh, that would be pretty ridiculous. Apparently he hid himself in plain sight. Now I'm not saying he disappeared, but whatever happened, they were blinded to his presence because according to the end of verse 59, the Bible says he passed through their midst. He went right through the middle of them and they couldn't touch him. And I think that's important because that speaks to the fact that Jesus Christ wasn't going to die according to man's timetable. He was going to die according to God's timetable. He would die right on time. In fact, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 23, the Bible says that Jesus Christ will be delivered by the determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God. It wouldn't be at the hands of man, it would be at the hands of God. And Jesus Christ will die right on time. And that should bless each and every one of us. Because that means we're going to die right on time too. You say, Clark, when will it happen? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm ready to go now. I mean, look, we're coming into this Christmas season. Things get crazy, amen? amen? I mean, we're out spending money we don't have, buying presents for people we don't like, and... <laughs> Everyone's crazy at the stores. I mean, you know, you, you see grandmas getting in fistfights over toys. It's, it's, it's the craziest thing ever. Now, Sally did win, by the way, but. <laughs> uh, 
you don't want to mess with her. <laughs> but the whole point to all of this is very simple. Jesus came to be the great I am. And as we come into this Christmas season where we're worshiping the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus said, I am whatever you need me to be. I will be your strength. I will be your high tower. I will be your deliverer. I will be your comforter. I will be your peace. I will be your rest. I will be whatever you need me to be. Whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're going through, whatever our struggles may be, and I realize we go through difficult times, man, Jesus Christ is our all in all. Ephesians 1.23 declares, and he wants to be that for each and every one of us today. Father, how thankful we are. Lord, for this incredible portion of Scripture, the proclamations, the claims that you made, and the comfort that you bring. And Lord, we do thank you that we can spend these few minutes together learning of you, worshiping you, so that we would become more like you. And Lord, we just pray, by your Spirit, you would accomplish your perfect plan in each and every one of our lives. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer for anything at all today, after the service, the pastors will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you, to love you, just to minister to whatever need there may be in your life today. And how I pray that God would richly bless you, pour his spirit out upon you and strengthen your hearts, your hands, guiding your feet, that he would become your all in all, as you enter into this incredibly beautiful season in celebrating the birth of our Lord. God bless you guys. I love you so much. Have a, have a great week in Jesus.